Hey gang, welcome to Big Brother and the Hodling Company, a podcast about music and Web3 and trying to fend off Big Brother. I'm a Keegan Voice. Today I spoke with Nick Marich. Nick is a seasoned entrepreneur with over a decade of experience in building and growing businesses across the music, media, and tech spaces. He cut his teeth in music by building and growing Songlink, which is a smart link tool for artists, and he stayed in the industry because of the artist relationships he built along the way. He then helped expand and deepen the community surrounding music NFT platform Mint Songs before taking over growth at Arpeggi Labs, which offers a suite of Web3 powered creation tools. We chatted about his journey and the insights that he has made along the way, a little bit about baseball and where life might take him from here. Hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Here we go. Hey Nick, it's great to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here. With all of these conversations, I'd like to start at the beginning and just get a sense of who you are, where you're from, and when your relationship with music started. Sure. I'm Nick Marich. I'm uh, a middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Currently, that's where I live now. If I had to give a quick summary about myself, I've always just been a passionate person about the things that I love to do during that current time. I started building businesses when I was about 12, 13 years old, starting with cutting grass to shoveling snow to teaching baseball lessons. I was an avid athlete playing baseball, basketball, pretty much my entire life. And I played college baseball and I bring up the athletic thing because while you're playing sports and you're on these long bus rides and you're going all over the country to play the thing you love, I always had headphones in and always listened to music in the process of trying to be just a better version of myself. And early on in Pittsburgh, I'm the same, around the same age as Mac Miller and Wiz Khalifa. I remember like my first time listening to music is one my mom loves to kill albums. So she'll just play the same album for ever until it's the thing that you're just like, get it out of my head. And my older cousin, I remember my first time interacting with music was in 1998. I believe it was the Mo Money, Mo Problems bass Puff Daddy music video that came out. And my cousin was just like, I just wanted to be like my cousin. He was like, you got to listen to this. And I really just followed him. And that's what opened up the door of me loving rap music. And I brought out Mac and Wiz because early in the 2000s, those were people that I saw performing at local shows here in Pittsburgh and just fell in love with really hip hop, R&B. My dad was a big Motown guy. My grandmother used to always play Motown on our Italian pasta dinners on Sunday nights. And so thinking on the early ages of myself and interacting with music, I never played an instrument. I didn't feel connected enough to music to want to do something with it, but I was just always listening to it, even to today. My first swing at a music company, we want to jump forward, uh, was in 2016, built a company called Songlink. I was focused on building a lot of tech companies from 2011 to now, but in 2016, built a little fun tool for people to be able to share music with anybody, including their friends. Uh, so if you use Spotify and I use Apple music, you would go on to song about link and you can still do it today. Look up your favorite song, album, podcast, and it has a link with all of the streaming platforms and the YouTube video embedded into that link. And you could share it with friends that took me down a road of, wow, the middle economy of music and independent artists are like entrepreneurs and there's so much of a gap in the space, mm-hmm. people making less than $10,000 and that top small percentage of people actually building a career around this mm-hmm. and was inspired to really jump into that 
head on. And that's what brought me into web three and it's what I'm focused and passionate about today. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I'm curious what, cause you said that creating this tool, like creating song leak was your introduction into the music industry in that world. I'm curious what the impetus behind the creation of that tool was in the first place. Yeah. So I was running a website and I would say product design agency, brand agency out of Pittsburgh. I worked with a lot of startups that came out of Carnegie Mellon, ranging from consumer goods to podcasts, media companies, to small businesses, fortune 500 companies, um, was really inspired to be a part of the startup ecosystem and moved out to Silicon Valley. During that time, I ran into, at my wife's actually Christmas party, ran into her coworker's husband, who was like, yeah, I, I built this little tool. It allows people to look up songs and albums on Spotify or Apple Music and it has this link. And it was very much just something that he built at a hackathon to pass his engineering class. And one thing that I was really good at that time was going to companies and doing market research and giving them strategy on how to develop the brand and the business of whatever they were trying to work on. So I saw this opportunity of smart linking tools of, I thought artists, and I saw this all throughout socials that they were just sharing SoundCloud links, you know, Spotify links, Apple links. And Linkfire at the time, I believe, was the only company among a few others, but this is before Linktree and some of the smart link aggregators that we see today. You had to pay a few hundred dollars uh, to use their services that had a smart link tool, but they didn't give you that much. They give you like, I think, some analytics, some data behind those links. And for a few hundred dollars per month, I saw an opportunity went back to him where I'm like, I think we could sell this on the music side. Something that started out as a little Slack app that people were backslash song link, type in any song. Many startups were just sharing this for fun at, at work at the time, because the people that, you know, Kurt, who was my partner at the time, built this product. He really was just like, maybe this is something we can go in on full time and I can bring on your agency. And so what became like a client of our agency side project of mine blossomed from there. We would meet daily talking about this product. We started doing some reach outs to independent artists, people that were just sharing links in their bios on Instagram and different socials starting there. And Hey, I just saw you release the song. There's this product called song link has all the streaming platforms feel free to use it and just giving this tool away that led us into a few thousand artists per month that were using our product to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands in just a short amount of time, less than a year. So I, I think the idea of the, go back to the original question of what was the real motivation behind this? is one, seeing the opportunity to work hands-on with the tech product that you immediately saw growth in. Two, Kurt, my partner, who is the engineer, the original person that built this product, seeing how our skill sets work together. And when you launch a company and you've talked about working on multiple side projects, it's not just the idea, it's the people that you're building with. And I really believed in Kurt's ability to build things at a fast pace. So we just had this like chemistry immediately. And this is somebody that like, I was a groomsman at his wedding and we're still really close today. And so you felt that chemistry immediately, wanted to attack this problem, seeing the opportunity in music tech. And it, at that time I was like entertainment tech, like I've never built something for this space. Those were all of the motivations for me to really jump in and give it that full effort beyond just being a client of our agency at the time. Yeah. No, that's cool. Uh, so what was the next jump after, after it was acquired? What, 
how did you get to mint songs? Like, how did you connect? There's with a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of time in between because it, we launched in 2015, 16. We sell to Linktree in 2020, 2021. That was a long acquisition process. You know, it went from a few thousand monthly users to 22 million active users in a course of four to five years. We didn't raise investment. We bootstrapped the entire company. Kurt and I sold to Linktree. And at the time I was like, man, after this acquisition, really like music. I don't, I found a lot of success in music tech, but that's not my background. I think I'll pivot out and keep working with other tech companies that inspire me. So I joined a company called Copilot, which is a fitness app here in Pittsburgh. But let me back up. I, after the acquisition, moved out of Silicon Valley, came back to Pittsburgh, wanted to be more in person with a company. And I saw a company come out of Carnegie Mellon. I was really inspired by the founder, the people that were building the product. So they raised some cash. They were looking for a VP of growth. So there was a lot of alignment, joined the team for four months. And while I'm working at the company, I just keep getting DMs and emails from artists that I worked with at Song. They're like, what are you doing? Like, why'd you leave the music industry? Hey, do you want to be my manager? And I'm like, I don't know anything. And you, you, you spend so much time building something, you don't realize the amount of relationships and the foundation that you built with all of these artists. Because I'm sure you understand this from an independent artist standpoint, you don't have a huge, some of these artists don't have a huge team. They don't have a manager, labels, all yeah. content creator. So you, as a tech company that partners with these artists, you almost become this connection point for them. And in a way you really help them because I'm helping them with their releases. And I'm like, Hey, do you want to add your ticket link or your tour link to your smart link? And what do you, what's your strategy around marketing? And you end up just diving deeper into how they are operating as an artist and realize you're an important piece of what they're trying to build. And so that, that was something that drove me back into the industry. I really connected with Garrett, but I chose co-pilot over men's songs and then came back four months later. And I'm like, Garrett, what about that growth position? <laughs> I'm getting all of these just people that are within my network that are friends of mine now that mm -hmm. are saying like, when are you going to release something else in music? But like, when are you going to work on something? And I didn't know much about Web3, blockchain. I just focused on how can you build revenue pipelines for artists? Try to simplify everything. Who cares if I don't understand every moving part about the music industry? Focus on what you're good at and join this company called Mint Songs because they're helping people release their music on chain that allows them not to chase a million monthly listeners, but maybe build up a few hundred bucks of revenue per month by releasing a music NFT. And so I was really inspired by the team. Eric Johnson was also on the team leading the artist strategy. He came from Spotify. Our head of product came from United Masters and Pandora. The two founders came from venture backed startups that they were building and when i realized the team that was working on the problem i was like okay i think i'm ready to make this jump hmm. and even after a short-lived four months i made the jump and all the way till the acquisition of napster i was all in on building that community doing and i caught it at a really good high point where it was we were doing Twitter spaces every single week. We were 30% month over month growth. Everybody wanted to be, especially in this independent artist field, wanted to be a part of, hey, so I could just release a song, focus on fandom, doing more with less. And that's what I feel like the value that I really drew was onboarding artists into this space that allowed them to oversee what is blockchain? Do I have to have a wallet? How do I set up a, like all these hard hoops that we've had to jump through to just focus on, okay, some of the projects or releases I can do in this avenue and I can find a way to build up a community within this space. And 
yeah, that that was if we want to put a pause there, that's what drove me to mint songs. And that's what really drove a lot of passion around just continually building those artist partnerships. I'm curious how you thought about growth in that those early days of onboarding artists into Web3, because it is, of course, like a pretty stigmatized space. It still carries a lot of stigma. And I think there is an aversion that people have, especially artists who have been like, fucked over by music tech historically. And there's that, and there's also just a natural friction of the technical kind of requirements that, that are necessary to operate in the space. So I'm curious how you were approaching growth as you joined Mint Songs. I saw Sound at the time, they raised funding, but it was an invite only type of mm -hmm. environment at the time. And we played that to our benefit. So a lot of those artists that were building in building with community were somewhat familiar with web three we're hopping in web twitter spaces to learn more just a little bit about what to do next one i focused on bringing on a lot of people from songlink that i worked with in the past especially independent mm. artists makes sense Two, every single interaction that i had on twitter made sure that we hopped on a call walked through the product i thought the most important thing i could do at that time was hop on a call with them for 30 minutes, figure out where they were in their journey, how much money were they making per month, where were they building their business, and how could we provide value to them? And then get them on the release schedule, get them into mm -hmm. our platform in an easy way. And so at the same time of focusing on onboarding, I thought our engineer, our engineering and product team did a really good job of making it easy for artists to be onboarded. And we built this reputation of being a friendly platform that welcomed artists into the space, did a lot of education around the space. And that's how we built the launching point. For me, focusing on those partnerships with independent artists that were somewhat of these like emerging music size between 50,000 to about 500,000 monthly listeners on Spotify were a lot of targets for me. I was getting pushed back from a lot of the majors and some of the higher up labels just on web three. It was like, I just want to see how this plays out. And so to me, that just made, okay, I have to prove it through doing releases with artists that are driving, especially on the independent side. So just working hand in hand with Eric Johnson and Nikki Bean, who was our community manager on onboarding workshops and doing like marketing releases and helping amplify every single release that was coming on our platform, then going to Eng and product and saying, hey, I think we need filtering. Hey, I think we need to make it easier for people to be onboarded in the space. We did this magic link where you could just sign up with an email and it made it easier for you to join and build a profile. Focusing on growth was just like in this in-between of artist relations, community marketing and product, and then just trying to help drive the narrative between the two. And it worked. We saw the, we came in at the right time. We raised money at the right time. It was December, 2021. So like at the beginning of that bull market, we rode mm -hmm. that all the way to March and we did a lot of fun experiments along the way. Like we did a partnership with Chill Pill and we invited all artists that we were working with in LA to Record Plant Studios and we made a song and we minted the song and sold the song mm -hmm. at the event while also inviting artist partners and Spotify and SoundCloud and people that were like peeking over the fence. What the hell is going on in this Web3 mm -hmm. music space? I think focusing on that just week to week sprints of onboarding release, how can we amplify these releases? The success of releases will help drive the success of our business. And then sprinkling in these fun, different off the wall experiments to help us stand out from a just a brand standpoint, I think was really beneficial for us. So I'm curious, because you were saying that a big part of your initial experience working with Songlink and then afterwards, and then what drew you back into the industry was a lot of the relationships with artists that, that you'd built. 
And when the decision was made to sunset bit songs, what were the reactions of the artists that, that you had onboarded in, into the ecosystem and what happened to your relationships at that point? What the hell happened to my songs? Like, where's everything? Yeah. <laughs> where does everything go? Um, yeah. We were really fortunate. We had a really strong team. Even looking back of working with a lot of teams from the agency front to starting businesses, that Mint Songs team was one of my favorite teams to date. And it probably will be throughout my entire career. We were all fortunate enough to get job offers. Almost our entire team within one to three weeks of that announcement of us sunsetting the platform. The founders wanted to go a different route and then that kind of led us to the acquisition. But I, Web3 Music is a very small community. So I had the opportunity to go into the Web2 space, go back with some streaming companies, or do I stay at Web3? And I had a few opportunities and I was really inspired by Arpeggi Labs, what Evan and James were doing at the time. I met them at NFT NYC a few months prior to that. And I just thought they were really smart, like just how they approached building things. And I really love their story. I'm a family guy. I'm somebody who's, yeah, you should start a business with your family versus what everybody <laughs> else says. And saw that like it was built by three brothers and tech and product driven. And they were doing some really cool things on chain attribution with the doll. And they had a, they had a need where they had a lot of product and, and, and Sassy Black was on the team leading the artist relations at the time, but didn't have much on the marketing growth partnership side. So I, I saw myself just being able to have an opportunity to execute for them. And so I, that's why I joined and that's why I stayed within web three and a lot of those relationships that I built in mid songs, they then came over and worked with us at Arpeggi. It was a smooth transition. A lot of people were already familiar with the product, already familiar with remix competitions and things that we were doing at the time. And it was just so easy to get them to interact and be a part of the product because we built that trust together up to that point. We spent a year together in Twitter space and, and Web3, a year in Web3 is 15 years. So you feel like you know these people from talking to each other weekly on calls to Twitter space to then seeing each other at conferences. Like you really felt a love and connection with a lot of people. And mm -hmm. So I didn't want to give that up, but I knew that if I went to a company that was close enough around what we were building at Mint Songs, then it would be easy to transfer a lot of those partnerships over. And that's really what happened. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, that bit definitely resonates. It's time just moves differently in this space. I'm curious how, as we moved into a bear market, if, if that affected your approach to growth at all in thinking about how to connect with people and how to talk about the offering at Arpeggi as well. Like, you know, how did that change as the market changed? Yeah, I think we all had to adjust and realize, hey, tracks that were uploaded on Catalog and Sound going for $11,000 in January 2022, those days are over. And you know, how a lot of artists came into Web3, they just wanted to adapt and be a part of emerging tech and find ways to build within their career. So staying in that mindset, when we hit bear market, a strong percentage of those artists adapted and left the market. From our point, it was a free platform that we built at Arpeggi, our doll. So doing remix competitions, having fun, doubling down on community, that's what you, everybody had to position themselves. They're doing a lot of free mints on sound. You've I'm sure you've seen everything that has happened within the bear market. It's okay. If we can't drive sales then we still drive community because one day we're going to be out of the bear market and who's going to have the most robust community and who's going to be able to then tap into some of those high points 
that they once had during the bull market. So it became like a quick shift to community. And as we were building our Peggy Labs, the doll, we then released kits. We saw an opportunity in the music licensing space, uh, especially to build a competitor to splice on chain. And you can go to kits.io today. There's a bunch of sample packs in there with, we just released one yesterday with Wide Awake and Jamie Sound of Fractures and 70 other producers were part of that pack. And we did one with Loners and we did one with TK. And we were able to continuously tell a new story in a different way with the release of Kits. And just six weeks ago, we released Kits AI that is not Web3, it's off chain, but building and releasing a product that allows people to create AI voices as well as being paid if they're on board as a licensed artist, which brought all of our community in from Web3 to help launch this product. We've been able to shift and chase after things that are working, drop things that are not working, focus on building a product that is disruptive, working with artists that believe in community and believe in what we've been building to this standpoint. And with Kits AI, it's been our best growth product, best product that has had the highest level of growth to date in terms of users on the platform, monthly active, daily active, and still going back to driving value to those independent artists. There's artists last month that made more money from being onboarded in our voice library than they did from music NFTs last month. Wow. That's always been the focus. And that's why I joined this team. It was the speed and the ability to stay within sprints and keep focusing on the next thing to build, the next thing to build. We are not done. We can't be complacent. How can we keep adding value? That's what has led us here today. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think the AI voice model that, that you built is super interesting. And I'm curious how that, because like Holly Herndon and like Holly Plus and the Grimes. DAO that she built around her voice. And then, yeah, of course, Grimes. It, it's like a, it's a really interesting way of being proactive about trying to protect your voice with all of the uncertainty that is AI and just people being able to steal your likeness and not having that much control over it. I'm curious if that has that narrative, has that been part of your narrative as you talk to artists about this and in, you know, how's that resonated with them? Yeah, that has been part of our narrative and that's what we built the person personal until approved license. So artists that are onboarded into our voice library, they wanted to get ahead of the AI space and say, Hey, if somebody uses my voice, they can do it on social for fun. But if they actually use my voice and they want to distribute this and commercialize this on all streaming platforms, then I want to be the one that approves those tracks and approves those songs to be able to be used if that's on a Rio Kragen AI page, or if that's on their own original Spotify page, they just wanted to be ahead of it. And so that's mm -hmm. been part of our narrative is how can we build rails that we see an opportunity to be an advantage um, and a support system for artists to take on AI in a way that they're not afraid. And they're like, my career is over. There's an AI of me, like I'm mm -hmm. done. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's why we built the platform, I think, in a lot of ways of offering that licensed voice. So you're paying $10 per month. All the sales are going to the artist based on usage, as well as the artists are setting the royalties. So if I make a track with your voice, I can submit it. If it's approved, you use the royalties based on what the artist set. And it just leaves it in the artist's hands where they can still align with emerging technology and be a part of it, but they control their likeness. And I think that's, we see a lot of companies have pop up and have been taken down. And we saw the Drake and the Kanye songs that were created. Mm -hmm. And that gave us all this knowledge and education to say, okay, with the relationships that we built to this standpoint, how can we be artists forward in this approach? 
And so I just commend our team of not just chasing what works, but chasing a way of something that can be viable for the music industry. So if you're a 15 year old kid and you just want to make SpongeBob voice models, you can come to our platform and do that today for free and have fun with that and share that on socials. And that's great. But if you're an artist and you want to create a licensed voice and have something that you can send to A&R teams and other producers and use it as a way to expand your current business and drive more revenue to your brand, you can do that. And you can do that on kits. So that really excites me. I felt like we were going through the bear market and the feels of that in the spring. And this has just been, Kits AI has been such a rejuvenation of energy within our team, within the product that we're building, within the community that we're growing. And it feels like we're actually doing, we're really doing a lot of things that are right for independent artists in the space. Mm, yeah, for sure. I'm curious if you can speak at all, like to the roadmap coming up of, I know it's split across at, the, at its point kits and then you have the DAW as well. What's something else that you guys talk about internally that, that you're really excited about? If you had the resources to build, the time, the market was in the right place, whatever. Yeah. What does that look like, if you can speak about it at all? I think building more tools for the Kits AI product. So we built like a YouTube and TikTok conversion feature, which allows people to be able to make their voices into a YouTube video immediately, as well as TikTok. And I think from the artist licensing side and the voice licensing side, it's being able to land a distribution partner that we can go from zero to hundred percent of come to our platform, make a voice model, people that use it, you'll see the sales from that as well as songs that are submitted. We have a distribution partner for you to use, or you can use one that like, if you're already using DistroKid or a platform like that to release your music, we can still do that, but just giving them that zero to hundred percent experience and building out use cases that the music industry is really looking forward to applying to their label, applying to the management company, their artist roster. And so I'm just looking forward to building out more use cases to show this isn't just for people to make SpongeBob voices. This is something that can be applied in a real way to the music industry. And during that time, we're going to have a lot of lessons learned on what's working, what's not working, and applying new products based on the feedback that we're getting from our users. So that's another thing that I think we're, we do a really good job of being in the pocket of seeing what's working, what's not working, and applying that to the next sprint. Yeah, amazing. And I think I saw somewhere that you, because I know you mentioned that there were people reaching out to you way back when about being a manager for them in yep. you know, your responses. I don't know anything. <laughs> so at that point, now you obviously do know a lot. And I think I saw that you're, you're managing Heno at this point, right? Yeah. So somebody at Mid Songs that I really connected to at the time was Heno. I was just really inspired by the his story, his ability to think so deep around a release or a cover or a strategy. I'm sure you've talked to a lot of artists and some artists just go through that checklist that this is what I need for a release. I know somebody that has always thought so deeply about everything that he does and everything matters and all this will connect. So I was really inspired by what he was just doing. He has a Web2 manager who has helped him with landing partners and placements and deals on the Web2 side. But he came to me after the mid songs, actually, right when the first person to call me, when the news dropped that mid songs was sunsetting the platform, he called me and was like, Do you want to be my manager on the Web3 side? Can you help me? Can you be like a growth advisor? And like, and it was just, it was a funny moment because we've had so many long calls about everything that he's doing. It was the first time that we've talked about it in this type of light. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to move on and I'm going to still 
do some advising stuff with Carnegie Mellon. I'm gonna uh, work with Arpeggi Labs, but like one really great thing that I feel like I wanted to get closer to was that artist journey and being able to be somewhat of an advisor manager for Heno on the Web3 side was a, an opportunity that I didn't want to pass up. And we've been able to do some really cool things. He has a video game that's going to be dropping that I'm really excited for people to see. He's still doing the work on the Web3 side and building with those collectors. So we're still inspired by everything that he's building on the Web3 side of the space. And yeah, so it started out as very much of a close friendship that turned into how can I help you, Heno? How can I help you? This There's a person I like just trying to help connect the dots for him is mm -hmm. more of what I've been able to do. Cool. Yeah, no, Heno's a very thoughtful dude. He's got a lot of inspiring thoughts and ideas and the way he frames things is, is cool. Yeah, he's one of the early guests on this podcast, actually. Um, oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah. Is there a world in which your future is, could be more dedicated to doing something like that, like being a manager for a bunch of different Web3 artists in the space, helping connect the dots and having that be your full-time thing? I don't think so. I think we're too early at the stage of, I don't know. I, there's something about like guys like Heno and people that are building up their own career. I just want to like help and not ask for anything and support. I really love just this role of being a mentor and advisor in some space, been able to do it with small businesses. I've been able to do it with brands, now being able to do it with some artists. I, I don't think my... I think one day I'll probably focus in on just doing advising, investing in these fun little mentor type projects. But I don't know if me being an artist manager is like in the cards for me. And I, I could be wrong. I could come back to you in six months and be like, hey, by the way, I just launched a company. <laughs> and like, <laughs> it's just, I'm just not there yet. It's not that I'm like not sold on the job that needs to be done to be successful. I just don't. I don't think I have enough context to the industry to do this full time. I think I can build a lot of relationships on the web three side. I can connect dots between web two, web. I think I actually think I could do the job of a, of a manager, but <laughs> you're I don't, talking yourself into it. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, right now I'm just, I really love what we're building the kids focusing on, um, more of a music tech product with a team and i'm just really enjoying that where artists are more just i think just like fun projects that i think i can add value to and i just leave it at that yeah cool i love that it seems like a good place to start to wrap up but yeah. i would be remiss if i didn't talk about baseball a little bit because it's something that I hardly ever get to talk about in this podcast. So I assume you're a Pirates fan. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of frustrations with how they run their business, but I've always been, yeah, I was a pitcher my whole life. I've always loved the Pirates. Yeah, it's just been something that's been part of me since I was like three years old. I think it was the first time I played on a baseball team and played my entire life. And I've actually taken a break from watching baseball since college because I hurt my shoulder, didn't end well. My dream originally was to go to the pros and then just be a coach and be in baseball forever. And just recently, I've actually come back to it. I'm doing long tossing with like younger kids. It's a, they like the high school field at night. I'm, I've thrown a few bullpens. So I'm actually just starting to come around and I recently had a son who's 11 months old now and we I've taken him to five pirate games this summer. Um, <laughs> cool. So I'm well, like, I'm, I'm getting back into the baseball mode, but yeah, yes, it has been such a love of mine. Yeah. I was saying, I started about the same age. I was a pitcher, I'm not a Pirates fan, I was a Twins fan, but I think we can probably commiserate over a lot of frustrations <laughs> with our franchises. <laughs> I love the Tory Hunter, Kirby Puckett. 
Yeah. Uh, so many good players in the Twins organization. Totally. Anyways, for those people listening who are here for the music and the Web3, thanks for indulging <laughs> that couple minutes of baseball. Appreciate it. Part two will be about baseball. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the next podcast. It's about baseball and Web3. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on chain baseball. On chain uh, hitting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So, one more question for you. Something I ask everybody at the end of these. You're going to a desert island. You get to bring three albums with you. What are they? Jeez. It's got to be Ready to Die, Romantic. Maybe Mace's first album, just because that's, or you know what, it's Swimming by Mac Miller. I've listened to that so much. I love that album. Mm. So I would say Ready to Die, Illmatic, Swimming. Cool. Oh, yeah, cool. That was quick. I'm just such a rap, hip hop head. I could listen to it all day, work, cut my grass, do <laughs> everything to hip hop. So yeah, that's what I'd be doing. Cool. And where's the best place for people listening to to follow you to get involved with any of the work or projects that you know that you're part of? Yeah, unlike some people that use multiple names for socials and uh, <laughs> everything, I just Nick Marriage across the board: LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram's more annoying pictures of Misha and my son. Twitter which I've been somewhat not active, but used to really dive deep into how I thought about the music industry and Web3 and probably something I'll pick up with soon. Um, and then LinkedIn's more of a personal business standpoint. But yeah, feel free to reach out. Always open cool. to having conversations. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, Nick. I've enjoyed this conversation and appreciate your time and your energy. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for this episode of Big Brother and the Hodling Company. I'm your host, McKeegan Voice, and you can keep up with me and all the latest Web3 music trends on Twitter at McKeegan. That's M-A-C-E-A-G-O-N. This show is a production of Decentral Media, and you can visit us at decentral.io, and remember, only you can prevent and fend off Big Brother. Big Brother.